So it's 2.15, time for this session to start. One quick reminder, um, after the session is over, as you're leaving, uh, there's some pods at the doors and two back doors where you can scan your name badge and provide feedback on the, on the session that you've just watched. So uh, this afternoon, Jason Healy is going to give us a talk about Above My Pay Grade. Jason? Hey, great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're having a good conference. Uh, I want to start with three warnings. Uh, warning number one is they gave me not one but two different laser pointers because um, I still think that's cool. Like these are freaking lasers and I have two of them and as far as I know you guys have none. Um, so I have laser pointer dominance. Uh, second warning, um, so we've got an hour for this um, and usually I'll drink water when I do these um, but today I've got coffee and Diet Mountain Dew. So it might be a little bit buzzy. Now the upside for you guys is that means it's going to be full of energy and interesting. It also means we might finish earlier because I am really excited right now. Um, but that's just going to leave more time for questions uh, at the end. Uh, third warning is this is total East Coast DC talk. Um, so I work for a think tank um, and to help people in DC understand cyber and vice versa. To get techies, the typical black hat DEF CON crowd, to understand what happens in DC. So that's this talk. Um, that means I'm going to say cyber something um, more than you really like because um, I just have these DC bad habits. So um, thanks for staying through me with on this. So above my pay grade, incident response at the national level. So my initial background was um, I came out of the military and then I set up the first CERT at Goldman Sachs uh, back in 2001 for Phil, for Phil Venables, who many of you might know. And so in that sense, incident response is these kinds of things that we know. Um, you know, it's the kinds of things that uh, we hear from the normal incident response community. Um, I took a, an article from, from Richard uh, Baitlick and I, and I did a little word map of, on it. And those are the things that we tend to think about incident response, um, the words that are going to come up in a normal incident response talk. Uh, other than saying them right now, compromised data, exploitation, intruder, I'm never going to say these words again for the rest of the talk. Um, because this kind of stuff that's so important to us when we're responding to an incident inside an organization, most of this stops playing um, when you're looking at a real national security cyber incident. And so when I say national security cyber incident, I'm meaning that to be it's more than just above typical cyber crime, but the kind of thing that you're saying, man, is the president, how's the president going to find out about this? You know, is this the kind of thing that cyber command is going to have to attack, really attack back on? Is this the kind of thing that really is that digital Pearl Harbor that we've been um, hearing so much about from so many of the DC policymakers? So none of this really plays within Washington, D.C., when we're looking at incident response at the national level. And this difference between incident response as we know it, as we've been reading about it, as we practice it in our day to day, and what we mean by incident response within at the national level has really important differences um, that lead to a lot of misunderstandings. And we'll finish up the talk with these misunderstandings, um, particularly when we're talking about attribution. I'm going to laze that. Um, it makes, made me feel, when I really started to realize this, um, it made me feel a lot better about how decisions get made and a lot of the things that seem very confusing and boy, those, those people in DC area won't be able to figure this out because this is such a technical field. The more I understood about this, the, the better I felt about how those decisions are going to get made. You may or may not feel better about it. We'll see. Um, and also make sure that you're understanding how large scale response um, might be working. So I took an example of large scale attacks on the finance sector. Um, uh, I haven't done this part of the talk past. Um, I haven't gotten Treasury or any of the others to check this. Um, but uh, I was in this very deeply and I, d I wanted to give them some arm's length in case I said something really offensive. Um, so let's take that. So let's imagine as a thought experiment 
a very large scale, we'll say it's a disruptive attack, it's not just affecting one or two banks, it's really hitting a number of systemically important financial institutions, the ones that we're really depending on, um, both for the equity and debt trades as well as you and me getting money out of the ATM, um, including even it's, hit, it's starting to hit some of the exchanges, um, clearing houses and the rest. So let's say it's pretty sufficiently bad that you're hearing people say maybe this is an act of cyber war, and for once your eyes don't roll, saying, like, oh God. And once you say, wow, man, maybe this is. Maybe this is what cyber war would look like. Let's just take it as a thought experiment for right now. So people like y'all are going to be inside the organizations plugging through, taking care of the incident response. You know, how can we get more bandwidth? What, you know, are there any artifacts from this? All the things that you're going to do as part of a normal incident response. Who's the first external call going to be? when a lot of these banks are saying, great, we're going to need help. Oh, who do you think their first call might be? FSISAC. Uh, I heard US CERT. I heard FSISAC. I heard US CERT first, so you get a copy of my book. Um, yep. The, um, it's the, uh, the first military history of cyberspace called A Fierce Domain, and it's on sale out here or on Amazon. Um, so uh, I've heard, I'm not going to go... Um, $9.99. Can you believe that for the ebook version? It's so cheap. Um, I'm not going to go with either of those answers right now, although we're going to get to both of those answers of US CERT and FSISAC. Because a lot of times when any of the big companies, a big multinational gets hit, their first call is going to be to the lawyers. Because um, they're going to need some people to help re represent them. They're going to bring them in. Hopefully after that, they're going to call in the professionals. Um, they're going to be calling the Mandiants, the Crowd Strikes, the Fusion Xs um, to come in and help them think through and get past this situation, especially if it's an intrusive attack, right? So far, so good. We know these guys. Um, and we understand this kind of incident response. I want to go past this. After they get there, they might call the cops. Now, I, I think it was interesting that I didn't hear any of that come up. And, but certainly they might be calling the FBI or their Secret Service. And I found in my experience, I don't know, for, for those of you that are, that are with large companies, it can be 50-50 in which ones they're going to call. Um, New York, when I was there, they, we tended to have better relationships with the Secret Service. Other places, there's a better relationship with the FBI. A lot of it came, comes down to who we served with. Um, so many of the people in, in, in the field, as you know, it, you know, might have been in the Bureau or the Secret Service or the military together, and those networks might decide which person, uh, which of those you're going to call. I'm not going to talk about this particularly any further here because that's important response that goes on, but it doesn't impact the rest of the system as much as the other things that we're going to talk about here. Um, I will laze them just so I can say I did it. Okay, good. Um, so important part of the response, largely going to forget it because we're going to drive on. So we heard FSI SAC, I think, from this answer, uh, from this side. Yeah, right there. Um, so I used to have been the, the vice chairman of the financial services ISAC. How many people have heard about the FSI SAC or any of the other ISACs? Oh, wow, it's pretty good. Um, uh, yeah, they just won the RSA, won the RSA awards for, for InfoSec organizations. And... When we kicked off, so it, it started in 1999, around then, President Clinton in 98 signed a directive, PDD 63, that asked each sector to set up something to do this. So they're really there for this operational level response. So the way they do that is it's going to be over a bridge. It's going to be an audio conference line where everybody comes on and we say, good, what are you saying? And I included some of the, some of the example questions that you're going to hear. Because it really is the operational level. You know, if it's, you might hear, you know, what's the, what's the largest, um, you know, attack stream or the attack size that you were seeing? Are there artifacts about this? Were you tracing this back to, you know, we find that rebooting the machine works or, you know, not, what have you guys heard from Microsoft? You know, are we going to go to Microsoft as one? Are we going to go separately or to Cisco? Um, so, you know, obviously I'm, I'm shading different kinds of attack types together there, you know. Um, um, but you can imagine they talk about all those things. Now, it tends not to be anonymous. Uh, when, when we had been setting up the ISACs, uh, everyone thought that it had to, if it wasn't anonymized, it wouldn't share. I can tell you it hasn't been true for at least 10 years within the finance sector. Um, one of my colleagues uh, was German, and he would come on, and we would have these calls to talk about this. And um, 
Yeah, this is the best we've ever seen. I cannot believe this. I'm not sure if we're going to open tomorrow. Sorry, all the Germans in the audience. But um, the so you knew which bank it was, right? I mean, you knew that his particular bank was the one having the the problem, and the relationships have gotten so tight that it's really not an issue anymore. It might have been an issue 15 years ago. It's really not anymore. Part of that's because there's so much trust. Part of that is also because um, banks are car- counterparties to one another. We rely on each other to be working, and if they're not working, we're not going to be able to work. So you do see a much more trusting relationship than you might, than you might imagine bet- in, in what's otherwise a pretty bloodthirsty kind of sector. So this is all we had up to 2003. So when I was vice chairman, um, and I was also running the threat and incident response working group, uh, after 9-11, we got a call from DHS. And they said, we want to share real terrorist data with you. Get yourselves on a call. And we're going to share, because we're seeing the, the, this potential terrorist attack that's going to come up. This was December, January time frame, maybe, uh, 2001 into 2002. And we're, okay, yeah, we'll take care of that. What did we know about that? Right? I mean, we were geeks, right? I mean, we're the cyber incident response people. Um, we didn't know about real physical response. And also, at best, we were CISOs. We weren't real C-level officers, right? Um, we couldn't really give advice to the Department of Homeland Security or the White House on this stuff. Because um, we were just not that level in the bank. And likewise, after 9-11, White House's DHS are rolling out all these policies. Well, actually, it wouldn't have been DHS yet, would it? Um, it would have been probably the NIPC um, uh, around that time. Um, and they'd be asking us to, to comment on policies. What should the nation do to help protect the finance sector better? And operational sharing group like FSISAC was just not the right group for that. So um, we stood up two other groups, this happened in 2003, uh, above them. So the first, uh, they're the FISIC and the FIBIC. And yeah, I'm going to use a lot of acronyms. Take, uh, I'm not going to explain them all. You take, take a picture and you can, you can look them up because it'll take me half an hour of the talk just, just to talk through all the damn acronyms um, in DC. Um, but the FISIC is there to fix all those problems that I talked about that we had in the ISAC. So this was real executives within the banks people that speak to the board on a very regular basis, um, that really do ha- understand what's happening in the bank at a very deep level, um, and led by a sector coordinator that is chosen from within the sector itself. So when we started, it was Bank of America. It switched over the years. I think it's, I think it's City now. Um, that's one very senior person that's going to represent the sector back to the federal government. And they also... they. Um, uh, FISIC is Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council for Critical Infrastructure Protection and Homeland Security. So it's not just cyber, it does the whole shebang. Now that's on the policy side, but they also have a role in crisis response. So whereas the ISAC call is going to be about what have we heard from Microsoft and you know, is rebooting the box going to work, they're going to be talking about the real policy level implications of this. And they're going to be not just talking about it in themselves, but they'll be talking with the government also. And that's the FIBIC side of this. Oops. Damn it. Um, so this side is private sector. FIBIC is government. So it's led by the Treasury, and it has all of the significant financial um, services regulators. So it's got the Fed, the SEC, CFTC. Um, all are sitting in the FIBIC. And they'll be talking about the government end of this. Hey, this is really bad. Are there things that we could do? Could we give them regulatory relief? You know, for example, normally you can't trade at home. You can only trade in the registered location. Should we waive that a little bit so that way they, can, um, they could work from home? Would that help in this kind of situation? And so you're going to be hearing in those conversations all of these kinds of conversations. You know, is the sector going to be okay? Do we need to escalate this further? Stuff that we would never talk about, you know, that we'd really get talked about uh, on the FSI SAC call. So let's imagine that this is significantly bad. Oh, the one thing I didn't want to say about that, it's not the government that decides if the markets are going to be open. The markets decide that ourselves. So if the New York Stock Exchange isn't sure if they're going to be able to open, they'll take themselves out. It's not the, the SEC doesn't come down and give that guidance. It's the markets that do that themselves. 
So let's say this is a really bad incident and this isn't a significantly high enough level. They will escalate further within the treasury because at this level, there's no political appointees involved. That has good and bad, right? Good means it's only the career civil servants, the folks that have more of a clue, right? Um, but it's also bad because career civil servants tend not to have that much power. Political appointees were appointed by the freaking president of the United States to be his eyes, ears, and to make sure things happen. So without having any political appointees, you've got to get it out of that level if it's really significant. So you now start escalating it up within, within Treasury. If it really needs to continue to go farther, it goes up to the President's Working Group. Now the President's Working Group, you can see, I mean, that is the Secretary of the Treasury, the Chairs of the Federal Reserve Board, the SEC, the CFTC. So if you notice, at some point, you know, right around in here, it's, and certainly by here, it stopped becoming a cyber incident. And it became a financial crisis. It became a financial incident. And this is really important. When you have this, and, and it may or may not be that, that black and white, but it certainly does happen. And it's an incredibly important switch that I don't think it's fully realized. So after I left um, being FSI SAC vice chairman, I was going to the White House. But I was waiting for my clearance to come through. You guys, some of you know how that process um, goes. And I was involved in an exercise where we were, um, we had finance sector involved. It was called Livewire. It was the first national level cyber exercise. And uh, we were, was going to be throwing attacks at the finance sector. And I said, this is perfect because I understand the finance sector really well, now well, decently well, as we'll find out. And I had been an Air Force signals intelligence guy. You know, I'd done all, mostly defense, but a little bit of offense. I'm the right person. I can design this great attack. So we did this awesome attack against the finance sector. False confirmations. We're going after trading. We're messing with ATMs. And uh, we got in um, what now would be the FIBIC and um, level groups involved. And we went, aha, here's our attack. And it was met by complete insouciance. Because one of the people in the room was the chief of staff to Alan Greenspan, the chief of staff of the Federal Reserve Board. And we said, we are going to mess up trading, so you've got a whole week of lost trades. I mean, imagine the, the value of those trades, of disrupt, disrupted equity trades. I mean, it's got to be in the trillions, right? And he said, well, you know, do, do we have you out of the system yet? Mm, okay, assume you have. He was like, we just roll back to, to last Friday's numbers. We're done. Wait, it's not that easy. We, we just did this awesome freaking cyber attack against you, and the whole week is bad. So we go back to last Friday. There'll be winners, there'll be losers. They cancel each other out. And it was, it was a shock because I thought I knew the finance sector, but I knew it as a cert guy. Because the stuff that happened at this level is different. I mean, these are the people that got together to decide, are we going to let Bear Stearns fail? Are we going to let Lehman fail? They're used to having to make really gutsy decision with not a lot of time. And the decisions that they might make aren't the ones that are going to seem obvious to you and I. They might seem, in fact, impossible to you or I. But to them, it's going to seem easy, like it, like it was to this guy. I mean, he got cyber. He spent a lot of time on this. Um, also, this can happen pretty quickly, right? I mean, remember the flash crash a couple years ago, you know, 20 minutes? If that had really gotten bad, this would have been the same group that would have gotten involved to figure out if they need to keep the financial sector from melting. So it's not like 20 minutes is, you know, you know a fast-moving cyber attack is necessarily going to scare them because they're used to have to making tough decisions and only maybe... Uh, a half hour, hour, a couple hours. So you can see what I mean, that different logic start, starts to apply, certainly around here, once it stops becoming a cool cyber thing, a cool information security thing, a cool technical incident, and starts escalating up to now it's just like any other financial crisis. I don't want to say just like any financial crisis, but it becomes more like a financial crisis that they can approach to look at 
as a financial sector issue. So I'm going to stop talking about, so this is the finance side, right? I haven't talked much about the, cy the cyber bits of this, and let's get into that next, because that's where we talked about here. We also know, you mentioned US CERT, it's a cyber incident, when we know DHS is responsible for that. But also, fine, we don't know, what does that actually mean, that DHS is going to be in charge of it? How does that work? What if it's out of their hands? So that's going to be what we'll cover in the next part of the talk. So first, it's going to go into the NCIC. I'm curious, how many folks have heard of NCIC? No, not, not as many. Um, NCIC is responsible for U.S. CERT, and um, I'm sure most of you, if not all of us, have heard about that. So the NCIC is a 24-7 operations floor for DHS to handle not just cyber incidents, um, that call them computer security incidents, information security incidents, but also telco as well. So the predecessors of this group were doing, for example, Y2K and could um, uh, the U.S. major providers um, survive through Y2K. That was all done through the predecessor of this group. So it's not just a computer thing, it's also a telco thing. And, and, and it's good that DHS has, has, has brought those together within the last, within the last couple of years. And just about any agency, department that's involved with cyber in any way is going to have a seat on, an N, on the NCIC floor. Maybe not on a day-to-day -day basis, but certainly as things start getting interesting, they'll start assembling in the team. They even have a seat there for the FSISAC. ISAC has someone cleared that can go and can go to the floor to help on the coordination to make sure that DHS knows what's happening within the finance sector and vice versa. So really important, it's the center part of what the, how the government wants to respond to these cyber incidents. And I included some of the other details of N, N kick in on this. Now if you're interested in how they expect to operate, they came out with the National Cyber Incident Response Plan. They call it the NSHRP, which I believe is still in draft. They haven't finalized it yet. Um, and that says how the NCIC wants to work, how they're going to try and handle these incidents that are going to come in, what if it's really fast moving, what if you have to involve state and local governments, what if, God forbid, it even includes the private sector, and they try and cover all of those things in it. So let's say, all right, it comes into the, into the NCIC floor, they've got US CERT off doing their things, um, they're, they're doing all these other things, they're assisting, they're assessing, um, all of these bits are going on. They're looking at any malware involved. They're doing the kinds of things that you would do if you were a DHS person doing incident response. It really is the obvious things, more or less. Let's say it's still really bad. And they need to escalate for, uh, even higher. Well, for them, here's where it gets really acronymy and, and DC-ish, and there's nothing I can do about that. They go to what, the, what they call the Cyber UCG, uh, Unified Coordination Group because they have U UCGs um, and incident management teams for other kinds of incidents as well. You know, if, you're having, if it's a big hurricane, if it's anything like that, you're going to have some kind of structure like this within DHS to handle it. And this is to get increasingly senior levels of officials more and more involved up to the political level, including up to the secretary if needed. Now, the NSHRA, the, the National Cyber Incident Plan, uh, Incident Response Plan, uh, talks about this significant cyber incident. And I've got this sort of fuzzy definition that I don't, I don't necessarily like um, that requires increased national coordination. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. And you can see their, defini their definitions on this. This is if they're saying, all right, this is going to be an all hands on deck. Um, this is we're really going to have to continue to escalate and really continue to push this. Coffee break. So I'm curious, has, has anyone heard of the UCG before or, or any of this stuff? There's a few. Are you all DC? I mean, you do work with DHS at all? No, just get a, just get a knowing Cheshire smile there. Okay. Um, so it still doesn't get called that much. They do exercise it when you, when you hear them talk about some of the cyber exercises. Um, that's them wa working through this process. If it's even more, if it's, it has to go above DHS, so this is good. This gets us to, up to the secretary of DHS if needed. So where does it go after that? Sorry? 
Secu yeah, the National Security Council. So in parlance, it goes to the White House, um, but in a sense, it's not really the White House. It's going to be across the street at the old executive office building. So after I left um, the financial services ISAC, I was working on what was then the Homeland Security Council staff. Now it's pretty much all National Security Council staff, which is there for the president to set policy and to make sure that um, as well as coordinate between all of the departments that are doing what they're supposed to. Obviously, it's not just DHS. There's a lot of um, uh, departments uh, that are involved in cyber. So he's looking to his National Security Council staff to really be there and help take care of this coordination. It wasn't always this way. Back in um, 1998, it was the FBI that was in charge, the National Infrastructure Protection Center. Um, actually did a pretty good, pretty good job of it. Um, which we created 2003, we had this dis disastrous organization called the National Cyber Response Coordination Group, NCRCG, where they said, um, justice said, well, we should be in charge of incident response because every hack is a crime. And DHS said, well, no, we should be in charge of incident response because we have the overall cyber lead within the United States government. Department of Defense came in and said, well, yes, but uh, any cyber incident could be an act of war. And besides, we're the only ones that have any real significant capability to begin with, so we should be in charge. So of course, we did that great DC. We made them all in charge. So it had three heads. Um, and so I was at the White House at this time. Um, I, I was sitting in, in what's now uh, with the predecessor of this organization. And we never once had one incident get escalated up to our level. We never once had the NCRCG saying, you know what, this is so bad that we need to start getting coordinated amongst us and maybe this is so bad it'll come to the president. Now that's 2003 to 2005, which certainly includes the beginning of Chinese espionage as well as a number of other significant incidents. The only time we had cyber incidents that ever got talked about at this level during my time was when the one agency that has direct daily access to the president would go and brief about something that they thought was bad and the president would go, hey, that is bad. What's about this? And then it would come down and it was almost never the stuff that was really bad. So what agency has direct access to the president? So yeah, the CIA now the director of national intelligence. So you get CIA briefers going in and telling about in interesting incidents um, that was completely separate from what was actually getting worked at at the NCRCG level. So the cyber directorate, um, that's, that's um, Michael Daniel, so the cyber czar. He's, he's not really a very czarish position, um, but he is the president's cyber coordinator. He holds the ranks of, uh, of um, SAP, special, um, special assistant to the president, which is a good title in the, in the White House. Um, if you're a special assistant to the president, you, you start to really matter um, uh, within the White House structure. And, He's got, his shop is, I believe it's still 10 people. So when you hear about the White House and the cyber czar, under his direct control, he's got no budget authority and he has 10 people. Um, two senior directors, eight directors, um, seven directors. So that was my level, I was a director. Um, and so, but what he does have is convening authority. And he's got the ear of the president. So if something like this comes up, um, he has, um, it had been done in this group called the IPC, it's an interagency policy um, uh, committee, but now they've set up a separate cyber response group, which is led by the White House, it might be a director at my level, you know, if we're not sure how bad it is, if it's just kind of bad, um, and someone at my level will be getting together deputy assistant secretaries, assistant secretaries, from the different departments and agencies coming in with their technical experts and for us to talk about it. If it is really bad, like we've been positing, it won't stay at that level and the cyber coordinator himself will start, uh, will start getting that together. In DC, this is called the interagency or the interagency process. And it's starting to regularize just like we did within the finance sector to take this stuff and it starts becoming no longer cyber incident, it's starting to become a national security cyber incident and soon it will, it will just even lose that and it will just become a national security incident. Because what's happening in the inter interagency here isn't that different than if we were talking about a coup in Pakistan um, or um, uh, a rise in tensions between India and Pakistan. 
So the cyber response group uh, will take place at the White House without a doubt. There might be some people coming in on VTC. Um, to start talking through the incident, figure out what happens, figure out responsibility, figure out what the United States government should do about it. Uh, and it will take place at the White House, either in the, in the Situation Room or um, next door at the old Executive Office Building. Um, and, and I was told why. Um, for some meetings I thought, this would be fun, let's go, to, let's go out to Treasury and talk about this. And I was told, no, we're the White House, they come to us. Because we have the power of convening and we never want people to forget that we're a White House. And I said, all right, well, that's pretty damn shallow. Um, but it's also true. Um, and having people come over to the White House and have to report and know that the president is just across the street or maybe just upstairs, it does give some extra oomph because people are not going to share information. They're not going to want to cooperate. Um, they are going to try and have their own rice bowls and not give up information or give up, give up prerogatives they think are important to their bureaucracy. Um, some of them might even actually believe that, actually, they do generally believe that um, they're for the force of good and their silo is the correct one. But it's the White House's job at this level to start breaking through that and getting to the right solution because that's what the president hired you for. So when I was doing this, um, we might have a lot of people that are feds, um, I was not a GS. Um, I could get hired or fired by the president anytime he wanted. I had the exact salary that they would give me. Um, and at the, which means, you, know, you fill out your form, you're a GS. We weren't, at least I wasn't, because I was a political appointee. Um, if he wanted to pay me 35,000, he could do that. If he wanted to pay me 150, he, he could do that. Um, and that puts you in a very diff uh, interesting position um, when you're at that level. So if we're saying it's gonna get higher up, it goes to a deputies committee. So this is the deputies of the National Security Council. So when we say National Security Council, um, I was NSS staff at this level. So we were, we were the people that, you know, the 10 people that were there to, to look at cyber. Um, and by the way, 10 is actually pretty good size for White House. The president probably only has about 15 people to oversee all of defense. He has another 10, maybe, maybe 15 to oversee all of the intelligence community. So even though 10 sounds pretty small, it's actually a decent size of bureaucracy within, within the White House. So the deputies committee is the first level that really matters. If you don't have a deputies committee, you don't have a national security, uh, a DC that meets on your topic, you actually don't have a national security issue. So you might remember 10 years ago, Dick Clark, who had been the cyber czar, he really was. He was also the terrorism coordinator. Remember, his, he came out with a book that said Against All, against all Enemies, um, where he made the claim that I tried to get the Bush administration to take al-Qaeda terrorism seriously, and they would not take al-Qaeda terrorism seriously. If you read his actual claim, he was saying, I could not get them to call a deputies committee. So it really is the, it, the level where DC starts to get themselves together to solve a national security problem. So when I say a deputies committee, it's not just the staff, like us chuckleheads down here. It is the deputy secretary of defense, the deputy secretary of homeland security, um, justice, all the way down uh, here would be deputy secretary of treasury for, for the issue we're talking about here, um, as well as any experts they need to bring in. So certainly General, General Alexander would be sitting in on this. Um, and any other experts that they, that they need we're gonna st are going to come in at this level. Because um, I'll tell you, if you don't have a DC, it's not a bad cyber incident. Now, again, when I, when I was at the White House, we never had a DC that talked about cyber. We maybe had a few that talked about policy issues, but it was still fairly rare. I mean, I could, they could probably count on one hand how many times it came up in my memory. And certainly none that I can think of for an incident. Um, now it's happening all of the time. What to do about China? Multiple DCs. Should we do Stuxnet? I'm told that, you know, if you, if you read um, what Sanger was talking about, it sounds like there were multiple DCs that, that, were, that were happening there. Um, to start churning through these issues, get everyone's voice to be heard on this. And I'll talk through some of the, the issues that they'll be talking about at, at the conclusion of the talk, which is getting closer. If they can't solve it, it goes to the Principles Committee, that is the President of the United States sitting around with the Secretary of Defense, with the Secretary of Homeland Security, and everybody else.
So certainly at this level, it stopped becoming a cyber issue, right? I mean, we're going to have the, cyber, the smart cyber people in the room, but this process is exactly the same as there is a Pakistani coup. And I'm sorry to just throwing that out. Sorry for any Pakistanis here. But uh, for any other fast-moving or national security issue, and it can happen very quickly too, right? And it's not like we cyber people, we, you know, it's not like only computer incidents can happen really quickly because supporting this whole process is the situation room, which is there to make sure the president can get the information he needs rapidly. When I was an intel officer, you know, we would practice to get things into the sit room within eight minutes so that it could then get to the president immediately after that if it was really necessary. So the intel people in the sit room trained to get things re up very quickly. So what I talked about sounds like this, a very slow process. And it might be. But if it needed to, it could also happen very, very quickly um, to escalate it up to the level of the president. Now what happens at this side, are they going to know what's happening in this, in this incident? Of course not. It's probably going to be new to them. It's going to be fresh. But like I said about the finance side, one, these are people that are used to having to make very difficult decisions with very incomplete information under very tight timelines. So getting it into them as quickly as possible is really good. Also, because now it's part of this regular interagency process, everybody involved knows how this works. It has, it has its own timeline, it has its phases, and everybody in the White House and that deals with, with high-level policy or incident response understands how that works. We're going to have a DC on this at 3 o'clock today. Everybody that's in that is going to go and start tasking their staffs, find out what's going on, go develop me options so that I, so that I can um, uh, sound smart on this, that we can, so that we can solve this, get any answers you need. And it really does trickle down to give this groundswell of answers, options, facts to the policymakers to work quickly. And by the way, I said um, uh, DCs used to be very rare. Now, if you're the deputy secretary at any of the departments, probably at least half of your job, any of the national security departments, about half your job is going to be involved going to DC meetings. It really is a significant part of what you're expected to do. Um, uh, President Obama in his first year held something like 300 DCs. So now it's part of a regular process. So that means that's good for us. They didn't do that for our issues, but it has also helped to get a lot of senior level people um, that are starting to understand cyber more because cyber has moved into those. So why does this work? So this works for a couple good reasons. First, the worst cyber conflicts, and we talk about this in um, the cyber conflict history book, A Fierce Domain, the more strategically significant the, co the cyber conflict, call cyber conflict string of cyber events if you want, the more similar it is to conflict in the air, land, and sea. Which means at our level we might experience these incidents as speed of light. It can feel like that sometimes and certainly General Alexander is off saying that that's how it is. But frankly we know it's not, right? I mean cyber incidents can take place over weeks, months, years. For us, I mean for, for you guys in your organization it could take place over months or years as you're trying to kick the intruder out of your system. But even for other things, Stuxnet took place over years. Um, the, the Russian attacks on Estonia unfolded over a month and a half, two months. Um, so it's not speed of light. There is time, there strongly tends to be time to be deliberative in the national level incident response. That doesn't come through when you have a lot of people that, na that today talk about network speed. And you hear this. Um, Cyber Command and others say, how can I get to talk to the president for authority to shoot back because in the five minutes it's going to take for me to talk to him, that signal is going to go around the world ten times or whatever. Turns out it tends not to be true because the single attack might go quickly but the bad guys are going to have to keep hitting over time to keep the target down. And that does give time for this process to unfold. Two, it works well because the senior policymakers they don't get cyber but they get national security. So if you go to them and say, oh my God, we're seeing a flood of Estonian cyberspace that's coming from 178 different countries, they're not going to know what that necessarily means. But if they say, oh, Russians are being jerks or you know, the Kremlin is supporting this thing happening, 
they're going to know how to deal with that. Um, and it takes it out of that process and it gets it up to this very time-tested national security response. I mean, we've been doing this um, in this way certainly since Bay of Pigs crisis, like 1961, where you had this kind of structure that was, that was really rolling. So we've got a lot of practice at it. And, and we can certainly see that countries that have this kind of process, that have a National Security Council kind of function, are really going to have a benefit over the countries that don't. So we've had discussions with, with the Chinese, um, you know, these informal dialogues with them, uh, some government people on each side, some think tank people on each side. And we walked through ex almost exactly what I just went with you with the Chinese side and said, well, how do you guys do it? And the Chinese had, uh, this was a year ago, so I don't, this probably hasn't changed much yet. They're really good at this interagency level. You know, it's clear the People's Liberation Army is talking to the Ministry of Public Security, can be talking to the Ministry of State Security. They all know each other. They seem to be talking very well. But they don't have a process to escalate it outside the techies up to the level of the Communist Party or the Politburo or the Standing Committee, the people that really matter, the people that are going to be having to take the phone call from the President of the United States or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff saying what's going on. Because they have, they're not linked here, I'm really worried that it's going to lead to much greater chance of escalation and miscommunication between the countries because they don't have that kind of structure. So it really does matter. All right. Also, and so why I think this is a good thing. So one, some things just, some problems are going to be so bad we're not going to be able to solve them on an organization organization basis. And even for the places that really do coordinate well above that, so you know, between the, between the telecommunications companies, um, you know, between the NANOGs, the NSP certs, for example, there are some things that just the government has to do. And it has to be the ones to take the decisions. Um, the president actually has the power, the authority. If we were at war or threat of war, the president's got all sorts of crazy authorities. He can use the Defense Production Act to say, I'm going to ship all the latest routers that come out, software, you know, if it's finance sector under attack, we are basically going to grab that equipment from when it's coming out of the equipment manufacturers and we're going to take it and we're going to give it to the people that need it and the president has the authority to do that. Theoretically, the president has the authority if we were at war or, or, or close to it under threat of war to order changes to telecommunications facilities. Block port X. Don't route anything that's coming in from this country. Um, uh, use the, you know, everyone must use this patch. He can order those kinds of things, theoretically, un under the Telecommunications Act of 1934. As a matter of fact, under that order, he can even have the military help defend telecommunications equipment. Now, that went back to the days when we were using radio and we were afraid that submarines could um, navigate, but the president has lawyers and others that are looking at these authorities and how they could be used in a cyber age. Um, also, he can give commitment of additional resources. People funding, um, I'll tell you, as an instant responder, there are lots of times I could have just used a good trained major that could just be a project manager or, or uh, someone to just take note so that I didn't have to do that. Also, determining what nation's responsible. Again, I talked about Russia versus Estonia. 178 countries were involved, if you, if you worry about the attribution. But obviously, if you want it to stop, the president needs to pick up the phone and call Mr. Putin and put pressure on him to make him stop. Lastly, it does not enable other levers of national power, diplomatic, economic. Uh, we could imply sanctions. We could revoke visas for the country, uh, people and countries we think responsible, or even up to military. So why it might not work? So first, it doesn't always work even for, for real incidents. You know, we get confused. Things don't go the way they're supposed to. Second, we see this a lot, and you see in the National Cyber Incident Response Plans, the government's going to want to control it. But no cyber conflicts have ever been decisively resolved by governments. They've been resolved by the private sector. And so this could really stumble if you're seeing the government come in, um, and the NSHRP is written this way. Private sector will tell us what's happening. We float it up to the Secretary of Homeland Security, who will make her decision, and then we'll give those orders out to the private sector, who will execute it, as if there were a military operation. And that's, we all know, that's not the way cyber things get fixed. 
Um, so if they really try and go down that path, this is going to make us stumble worse than we have to. Um, Katrina, Katrina, one reason Katrina was so bad was because th we have a federal system. The state has to ask the feds for help. And Katrina was bad because it kind of walloped the state and they weren't able to ask for help in any reasonable way. And there are those kinds of edges in this system also. Theoretically, a smart adversary could try and exploit those, but I think it's difficult. Um, the last two, one is uh, I call the Six Day War, um, which was a fight between uh, Israelis and Arabs, where it really kind of was decided in the first day of the battle. Quick airstrike largely decided the very first day how the rest of the war was going to happen. So this is going to take some time. And if the strike is really that fast that they could hit us and have it over in a couple hours, like if we start doing smart grid, you know, if we start connecting stuff that really breaks, stuff of steel and concrete, then this might be too slow. And last, if we have a true cyber war. And again, I, I hate that term. I'm using it here because I really mean war. Thousand, even if you just, even if you think it's BS, just take it as a thought experiment. Thousands of people dead, smoking holes in New York. Neither side has been willing to escalate to real kinetic weapons yet. It's all been using cyber means. Because then you end up with something like this. Because if you're really at cyber war, you've got no fewer than five four-star generals that are going to feel enabled to get involved. You're going to have cyber command. He works for strategic command. Northern command looks over the homeland. They're going to want to get involved. If it's, if it's, you're going to have a regional combatant commander. So if this is, you know, an Asian country that's doing to us, it'll be Pacific command. If it's a European country, and it is pff, most likely to be a nation state. It's, it's really not non-states that can do this. Plus, you're going to have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. You're going to have governors that are coming involved and saying, this is happening to my state. FEMA is going to be getting involved. The um, FBI. And there is, we just have no way to try and coordinate all of this. In fact, I don't even think we, we exercise this. We exercise kind of what, what's today like and then what would a little bit worse be. If we ever saw this, if we would really get caught out if it were this bad because we're just not ready. And by the way, DHS that actually has learned some painful lessons about how to work with the private sector are going to get pushed aside completely because the U.S. people and the president are going to look to the Department of Defense to be our protectors and DOD really doesn't understand well how to work with the private sector. Why should they? So if we need call, if private sector needed calls for fire, how are we going to stop these people? This is just not a good system to figure all of that out. And last, so certainly within the Beltway, we think the left side, I'm sorry, this side of the chart is really cool, but it's really here that the trenches. Now for the military people, the forward edge of the battle area, the FIBA, is here. And all too often in DC, we, we think that we're making a difference. Um, and I hear this a lot from a lot of the government or military cyber defenders. We need to know what's happening so that we can do something. We've got to remember the private sector is the supported command, not the supporting command. It's DC that has to give you guys support so you can win the war. It's unlikely to be won by anything that happens at Fort Meade. That's the end of the talk. Time for Q&A. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I think line up the mics is how you want it, Kevin, or? Mm -hmm. All right, well, I'll sit then. <laughs> Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, of course. No shit. Oh, that's awesome. Fantastic. I, uh, questions and answers if you want. Mike right there. Um, yeah. Oh, excellent. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, if you talk to people inside, they say it's all smoothed out now. Um, 
and um, you know they've they've worked out a lot of the issues. Um, and I think until DHS has actual, um, it's going to take a long time. I think it will help a lot if they switch NSA, if they split NSA and Cyber Command, which I think they have to do now. I have a um, question. I think that that'll hopefully at least. Oh my God! An actual question, ladies and gentlemen. Question. Sorry, we'll get. Has the thought gone into or analysis of that whole process and the chart with all the organizations if we actually need to respond with our own cyber response? I mean, for companies? No, for the government sector. Oh, oh it's yeah, it's been yeah, yeah. bandied about in the press about we're, auth we're authorizing offensive. Right, right. And so, so that does go through this sort of process um, of, so this happened in, in stuff in the war of terrorism where, hey, we think we might not shoot back. That goes into a deputies committee. Is this the kind of right thing that we want to do? Um, and so that's going to happen at the D.C. Um, if it gets really bad, and they have standing rules of engagement that says, all right, Jenna Alexander, you can shoot back if it's this bad, but if, if you want to do anything worse, you get to go to the president. Once we start getting past a certain point, it's going to get more regularized, and he's going to know what shots that he's, he's pre-authorized to take. All right, second question. Could you comment on the uh, level of participation and the different kind of organizations between um, different sector ISACs? Do we have do what you, on? Do you think all of, between different sectors, oh, oh. do you think they're, I mean, they're organized in different ways? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, the, so the there, question is. Um, there are some more successful models, and yeah. can you comment on the, the level of participation uh, within the industry in the ISACs? I, I, ISACs are generally considered, I think, a, a, a not successful model. Um, FS is certainly the, considered the exception and the strongest because you've got this trust. It's generally worked. Everybody's pretty well funded. Um, a few of the others are, uh, also work pretty good, uh, the I IT, if, uh, some of the others, especially where they built on existing organizations. Like the Telco ISAC built on this existing structure of the National Coordinating Center, so they had something in place. Energy had structures in place. Um, uh, but I think nobody is fully happy with the system. Good question. Um, I think more government support to help make it happen. Um, FS, ISAC in 2003, we, we weren't necessarily going to make it. Treasury gave us a $2 million grant so that we could recapitalize ourselves, so that we could bring in all sector members rather than just those that paid us. Um, and I think that was the best $2 million the government ever spent on cyber. Um, certainly a lot better than, you know, just giving it to Cyber Command to give to, you know, to, to Booz Allen. Um, sorry, Booz people. Um, the, um, so I think looking at the private sector as the supported command and saying, good, what we can do to make the non-states really succeed at this um, and forget that, that the government's going to actually have the solutions, I think that could be a real help. Because it's going to look something like ISACs. Sorry, give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of standards, uh, to automate the, the sharing of incident data with the government and between different ISACs, are there specific standards or protocols that are emerging and getting adopted more than yeah. others? I'm not sure I like this because you have a beer and I don't. Um, the, uh, so it started out where when, when we were doing the ISACs, and I think this is part of the failed, failed part of the ISAC model in the earlier question, um, we were all talking about sharing data fields. Which data fields do we need to share? And there wasn't trust. So it was a complete wrong model to be talking about data fields when we didn't trust one another. Now, fortunately, with the FS ISAC, we, got, we went down to Florida every six months and we got hammered like hot tub hammered. Um, and you knew everybody. You got to be friends with them. You knew that if you shared information, they weren't going to squeal. And so now the FS has gotten themselves to a place where they can start talking about sharing data because you've built up this trust. And it's happened with the government. The government people, we know the government people, we know them, they know us. Lots of information gets passed back and forth. Um, but you had to do the trust first. And I think this is like the previous question, I think, that the more that we've had that trust build up, the more that we can look at standards of sharing. Now, fortunately, a lot of the ISACs are run by the same companies. They'll, they'll have an ISAC business model, and they'll just try and support different ISACs. And so that, of course, helps sharing, because it's the same underlying backbone, the same engine of the same companies that are involved. Good question. I actually have a follow-up question uh, towards uh, you know, the lady's earlier question about what would be a better model are there other national models that work well? Obviously, Estonia had to evolve yeah. a lot. Uh, Japan uh, has evolved a lot lately. Taiwan. Are there other models that, that work? Not for big countries. Um, you know, 
the Singapore's, the Estonia's, the Taiwan, um, they they have the advantage of being smaller, medium-sized country that has you know a large country next door, you know a large neighbor. They they might have national service, you know the draft. I mean, it really does put in a very difficult way that I don't think works very well um, for the U.S. The U.K. model is much more based on hey, I know a bloke. Um, you know, in the U.S., if you're going to get people together, you, it's difficult to exclude any company. Um, and in the UK, it's okay, right? Because you know, you went to Oxford together, right? And um, and they still have that informal that has some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, so I think it's got to be for the U.S. It's got to be something like this, um, but that we might just have to build more trust and build more in um, the Dutch. Great system, because they have the companies at the top level of governance. Like at that level of National Security Council, they have companies that are sitting in, like their top telcos, for example, um, that are there to help steer the whole system. So I want to push the U.S. to have a non-state-centric cyber strategy that says, because right now we don't have a cyber strategy. We've got a collection of words that we say assemble together. You know, Petraeus had a counterinsurgency strategy, population-centric, win the hearts and minds. You could negate that. You could say, don't win the hearts and minds, kill the bastards. Um, we don't have a strategy like that. Our strategy can't be summed up in any fewer words in every goal that, that's listed. I want to push non-state centric that said, let's put the non-states, they need the help, they're the ones that are going to win this fight, um, so what do we have to do to support them? So.